Madam Vice Chancellor, it is also my pleasure to present to you Dr. Atul Gawande, <coughs> a renowned surgeon, writer, and public health advocate. A Rhodes Scholar and two time Harvard graduate, Dr. Gawande has dedicated his life to improving healthcare worldwide. Ariadne Labs and Lifebox, two organizations for which he serves as executive director and chairman respectively, are devoted to reducing suffering and saving lives through systems innovation and making surger, surgery uh, safer globally. In 2006, he was named the MacArthur Fellow for his work investigating and articulating mod modern surgical practices and medical ethics. Dr. Gwandi is a practicing general and endocrine surgeon at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston as well as professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He is also the Samuel O. Thier Professor of Surgery at Harvard Medical School. An acclaimed, prolific, and influential author, Dr. Gwandi has written extensively for The New Yorker and Slate and has been the recipient of two National Magazine Awards as well as the Lewis Thomas Award for Scientific Writing. His exquisitely crafted meditations on the problems and challenges of modern medicine have led to the publication of four best-selling books, Complications, Better, The Checklist Manifesto, and Being Mortal, Medicine and What Matters in the End, Exploring End-of-Life Choices and the Effect of Medical Procedures on the Terminally Ill. His most recent book, Being Mortal, challenges many of the traditional notions about the role of medicine. It served as the basis for a documentary for the PBS television series, Frontline. Dr. Gwandi is a firm believer that society must look at new ways to practice medicine, with fewer cowboys and more pit crews, as he likes to say. He believes that our medical systems are broken, doctors are capable of extraordinary and expensive treatments, but we are losing our core focus, actually caring for people. Passionate about the importance of this topic, his 2012 TED Talk entitled, How Do We, Deal, How Do we Heal Medicine, has garnered more than one million views. Considered one of the top global thinkers and arguably the uh, most uh, widely uh, read communicator in the English language at this time in medicine, Dr. Atul Gawande's enduring commitment to public health at the local, national, and global levels makes him an exceptional role model for our students and for all health practitioners, scientists, and public, public health advocates. Madame la Vice-Chancelière. Je vous présente le Dr. Atul Gawande afin que vous lui dessiniez le diplôme de Dr. S. Science Honoris Causa. Je voudrais maintenant inviter Mme Suzanne Levesque à s'adresser à l'auditoire. Professeur Suzanne Fortier, principale et vice-chancelière, Dr. David Eidelman, Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Vice President Principal in Health Services, Mr. Cobet, and members of the Board of Governors, membres du comité de sélection pour l'attribution des grades honorifiques et pour la collation des grades, Professor Michel Tremblay, Chairperson of the Jean and Jade Willevec Chair in Cancer Research at McGill. I am truly grateful for the honor you bestow upon me. Thank you so much. As for you, graduate in the Faculty of Medicine, I have a message. It should be part of your life. It should guide you in your profession, or it may make you change your orientation. These are the most two important words. Be happy. Et le succès vous sera assuré. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Madame Levesque, pour ces mots très appropriés. 
And now it is my honor to invite our most recent graduate, Dr. Atul Gawande, to deliver the convocation address. Chairman Cobbett, Principal Fortier, faculty, families, friends, and graduates, thank you for this honor. And most of all, congratulations to the class of 2017. I want to thank you, the graduates, for devoting yourself to understanding and helping with the frailty of human lives. We are lucky to continue to draw the hardest working, most talented, and most responsible people in our society to these endeavors. Your parents may have had their doubts that I'm talking about you, <laughs> but I really am. However, as I walked my own path in medicine and science, something began dawning on me as it may have dawned on you. And that is that no matter how hard I worked, how smart or conscientious I tried to be, the volume and extreme complexity of the know-how and technology that we are called upon to use has become something that is rapidly exceeding my capacity as an individual or yours. We're all trying to swim in a rising sea and it is all we can do to stay afloat. The solution that we each end up taking, therefore, is to become specialists in some way, to find a little boat to hang on to in a small patch of that ocean. That strategy of reductionism, of focusing on only a fragment of the whole, has paid huge dividends. We've come through the century of the molecule, and it has given us the gene, the neuron, the drug, the microchip, and focused each of us on becoming experts in ever narrower spaces. And yet we're finding the power of reductionism is more limited than we expected because it turns out that how things connect is ultimately what matters. For example, you have to understand how genes interact if you want to explain disease, how neurons network together if you want to understand consciousness, and likewise how those drugs, devices, and specialists all best fit together if you want to consistently produce longer, better lives for people. We are in the midst of a shift from the century of the molecule to the century of the system, and it is vital that you understand the implications. A key characteristic of systems is that the whole is more powerful than the parts. And this may seem obvious, yet it's not something we learn very much about on the way to becoming professionals. We instead learn to prize autonomy, the idea that we each keep each discipline and each ourselves keep our heads down, just doing our piece as we judge best. But a collection of autonomous individuals will always produce poorer results than a group that acts as one. And achieving that requires some degree of effort and intention. In my public health research, I've gotten to work on a team that has been exploring and testing this truth. For instance, we devised with the World Health Organization a safe surgery checklist to strengthen teamwork in operating rooms. And all it does, it asks everyone to pause briefly to do some very simple things, to confirm that everyone knows one another by name and role, to discuss the unique considerations of the patient in front of them and the procedure they're about to do, and to confirm that the steps to control the big killers, like infection or bleeding, haven't been missed. And it sounds totally elementary, but we'd had no system for doing those things before. We ended up testing our checklist in eight hospitals, and the results were published in 2009, they showed that every hospital had a reduction in complications. The average reduction in deaths was 47%. It stunned even us. I later learned that all we had really done was demonstrate organizational management 101. <laughs> the checklist set a table that brought people together, however briefly, in a small little room 
to articulate their goals for each patient, to confirm they had who and what they needed to achieve those goals, and to make sure they're all pulling in the same direction. Because when people are pulling in different directions, they don't get anywhere. All they get is demoralization, burnout, and bad results, no matter how hard working or how smart they are. And I think you've all seen that in moments along the way. But when we are pulling in the same direction, the work can become effortless, even beautiful. I want you to raise your hands. How many of you have been in an operating room among the graduating class? And how many of you have seen the safe surgery checklist in action? Nearly all that raised their hands. And it's extraordinary to see how it has spread across the world. But now I want you to raise your hands to say how many of you have also seen people in the operating room dismiss the idea of the checklist. About half of those hands went up. People have not yet all agreed to follow this path. But my team has learned to make it happen ha it occurs by following the same principles. You don't scream at people, you don't yell at people. Instead, for the last few years, we've carried out a further experiment with the entire state of South Carolina. We supported its hospitals to each set a table that gathered the leaders to agree on the goals for all of their surgical patients, including adopting a checklist, and to walk together through a joint process of execution. It's the same elementary idea, but when we published the results last month, they showed that compared to others, the hospitals that completed that simple program reduced surgical deaths by 22% at a statewide scale. They saved as many lives in their communities as were lost in car accidents. Yet still, we only reached 40% of the state. Hospitals for the other 60% didn't succeed in completing the program. The hardest part? Just getting people to come together and devote effort, get to that table, to devote effort to functioning as a system. And that is the challenge across all of medicine and science. Building better systems is now our biggest opportunity to advance human health. Lives are being lost from failing to realize that. So I have a request for you. <laughs> Somewhere, there will be a need for people to come together around building a better system. It might be in a clinic that you're in, on a hospital floor, in a scientific laboratory. And my request is that you join to help. It might be a pain. There may be some annoying people at that table I'm asking you to join, but join. Moreover, I want you to work at this. It is a skill to be part of setting collective priorities and then working for all of us to pull in that direction, to help the many connect into a whole. Developing that skill will take you time, but it is a capability, it is your one capability, that artificial intelligence will never replace. And developing it will be the most important thing you can do to save lives and reduce suffering. And I have one more request for you, and that is for you to be willing to take your voice even further, not just in your clinic, not just in your hospital, but into your community, for your voice is needed well beyond health and science. The core values of our communities at large are up for debate across the world, but we have a core set of values in medicine and health that are needed by all of society. These values are reason, human decency, community, and a foundational belief that all lives have equal worth. Today, you are not just graduating, you're also committing yourselves to live by these values and to serve needs that are larger than just your own. There is no time we need you more than now. So today, we not only rise to congratulate you, we thank you for all you're going to do wherever you go. Thank you.